morning, everyone. Let's take our songbook and turn to page 243. I am resolved, page 243. When you find that, let's stand. We'll sing all four stanzas this morning. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's divine. This winter time, January, we don't know what the weather is doing, but I'm so glad many of you were able to attend and come this morning and uh, be here. It looks beautiful outside right now. The sun is shining, wind is blowing, temperatures are dropping, but it looks beautiful right now, and uh, I am I am so glad you're here with us. And uh, a couple things, just want to ask you to be praying about. Uh, pray for, of course, Karen Reddick is recovering from. Uh, shoulder surgery, and she'll be in rehab and therapy with that. And uh, Brother Mal Espino will be uh, starting some cancer treatments at the end of the month. And uh, so if you'll remember him in prayer, he's home, not feeling well. Something hit him. He called this morning. He's, he's uh, sick right now. So uh, please keep in your prayers. Also, if Mr. Shoulder, we're glad to see her t today. And uh, she's been having... Uh, go ahead. You can applaud. All right. Isn't that pretty cool? You just show up and you get an applause. Amen. And uh, you don't realize I do that all the time. And I look out the door and see people there and say, oh, praise the Lord. They showed up. Amen. And uh, But uh, she has some more tests they're going to be running and uh, trying to get her uh, back to feeling well again. But we're glad she's able to make it out uh, to be with us this morning. And, of course, we have several other people we want you to be praying for. Um, I've been having trouble with uh, a lower back problem probably forever and uh, just put it off going to the doctor so uh, I had about three weeks where it was giving me a real bad time so I went to the doctor's Thursday and um, you know we're talking about doing some therapy and so forth with it and uh, getting an MRI but that Thursday I was in here cleaning the baptistry and I lost my footing in an empty baptistry and fell and uh, landed on the steps and you know that soft spot in your lower back uh, where the kidney lives Amen. I just beat him up real bad. And so uh, that's a lot of pain. I know I just want to share that with you because uh, the care and concern uh, came out and said I, I had hurt my back. And, and I don't like to try and make a big emphasis about that. Um, but I'm, 
I appreciate your prayers. And how am I doing? Well, it's, uh, it's not happy with me yet. Amen. And so it's going to be a while. It's pretty much like a bruise. If you bruise your shin, you know how long that lasts. But uh, this bruised a bunch of things inside there uh, in the lower part of the back. And so they're not very happy with me right now. So uh, we're just getting along the best we can. And I do appreciate you praying for me. Don't pat me on the back and tell me, Pastor, we're praying for you. Amen. And uh, you can shake my hand and tell me that. Uh, but uh, we are uh, getting along and we'll continue to get along um, in spite of the things we do to ourselves, all right? And uh, our missionaries, of course, we want to be praying for uh, Brother Wesley uh, Pela in Brazil, Brother Zachary in India. And again, we don't put last names in because the dangers of, uh, of um, uh, persecution they find in these countries. And Basim uh, uh, Artemis in Algeria, the last two are uh, national uh, men that are... Uh, we have a missionary uh, that works with these men and trains them, and they sit, go out and began to go into villages and, and share the gospel. And when they win people to Christ, they try to establish a church inside those villages. And so these men are, are living there, very faithful, their family, serving the Lord, and, and probably in a lot of difficult, more difficult situations than you and I would be able to uh, do. Uh, that's their culture, it's their way of life, and for us to go there, and try and live in the circumstances they live in, and it would be very difficult uh, for us uh, because it would be hard to adjust to. But these men are already there. They and their families, they love the Lord. They're serving the Lord. So uh, please keep them in your prayers. And, of course, we're adding to events coming up this year. Uh, I'm going to continue to add some more things that are coming along. And I want you to set these dates aside. I want you to be part of, of all the events. We have Pastor Rob Foreman joining us in March on the 16th and the 17th. It'll be a, a Saturday night and a Sunday he'll be preaching for us. And, uh, of course, Easter is coming early this year, coming in March. Amen. We might get some snow for Easter. Wouldn't that be exciting? Amen. And we don't like that. We'd rather have sunshine and flowers. But I'm so glad you're here this morning. Why don't we take our songbooks once again, turn to page 311, Redeemed. Page 311. And let's st stand when you find that. We'll sing the first, the second, and the last stanzas. Redeemed and I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. So happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me that continually dwell. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, redeem, his child and seated and we're going to receive our offerings this morning and uh, brother still wagon would you please lead us in a word of prayer today
Please take your songbooks. Let's turn to page 276. Jesus is all the world to me, page 276. And when you find that, let's stand. We'll sing all four stanzas this morning. standing and take your Bibles this morning and look to turn to the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. Right after Isaiah, if you find Isaiah, the next book over is Jeremiah chapter 18. You got it. Good job. Amen. Bible drills. I don't have any Tootsie Rolls right now. Amen. And uh, we can work on that up here. Jeremiah, chapter 18, and follow with me as I begin reading in verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessels that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again in another vessel as seemed good to the potter and to make it, uh, potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, 
of the house of Israel. O house of Israel. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in church and to hear your word uh, being preached. And I ask for your power and wisdom and direction in the message. And Lord, help us to have hearing ears. An open heart, Father, know what your will is for us. May you bless this time we have. May you bless the music. May you bless the service in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Prophet Jeremiah is speaking here to the house of Israel. God, of course, is speaking through Jeremiah. And the house of Israel, or the people of Israel, they had a struggle in their life. <laughs> it, all you have to do is continue to read through the Old Testament, and you see how time and time again they flourish in living for God and follow His commandments, and other times they're punished for their rebellion toward God. It seems like a endless cycle that goes on and on and you say well what's wrong with those people why can't they get it right well it's probably the same reason why we don't get it right amen and uh, we are constantly doing well for a while the next thing you know we're not doing well we're doing something bad and doing something wrong and sometimes we even get away from church for a period of time but this is a a brilliant story that the lord gave us here in how he treats his people, how he works with us. And we do fail, we succeed and we fail, we succeed and we fail. We find in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, it says, But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay and thou art the potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. God is working in our lives all the time. And one of the things we need to establish in our own mind and heart, just Really, get it established and go on, and it's always the way it's going to be in your thought, thinking process, and that our Heavenly Father is good. He's good. He's good to us, and He is love. You know, the gospel, in the, in the books of John, it tells us that God is love, and uh, <laughs> so we have a good Heavenly Father. We have a loving Heavenly Father, and so when we walk this life in the Christian walk right now, we're going to go on and we're going to stumble and we're going to fall at times. 
Now, some may say, well, why is that the case? Why is that the situation? Let me back up just a step here. When I mentioned to you that God is good, when God created everything, everything God created was good. It was good. All you need to do is read down through some of the verses I'll share with you in Genesis chapter 1, when God created everything. You know, we read in, in verse 10, it says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he the seas, and God saw that it was good. We see in verse 12, And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. In verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light and darkness, God saw that it was good. What is that talking about? The stars and the moon and the sun that he, he put into the heavens. He said that was good. In verse 25, and God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw it was good. In Genesis chapter uh, 1, verse 31, and God saw everything he had made, and behold, <coughs> It was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So everything that God has created is good. In fact, Satan, when God created Satan, that was good. Now, you need to understand this creation. Satan has not always been called by that name. He's not been called the devil in times past. His original name well, still is, is Lucifer. He was an archangel of God. He is one of the three archangels that God created to guard around his throne to protect the throne. In fact, his, uh, uh, his area, I guess, or talent that God gave him was music. And, and uh, he brought all, forth all sorts of good music and great music. And it blessed the heavens. It blessed. And God had created everything that was good. The original creation was good. All of it was. But then, of course, Lucifer in his pride felt that he was equal to God. In fact, he felt superior to God to a point that he could overthrow the throne of God and ascend to it himself and reign over all things. But God cast him out of heaven with those other angels that followed him. One third of the angels fell with Satan out of heaven or Lucifer out of heaven to the earth. And, uh, but some, cause sometimes people will say, when you speak of the good things God has made and you make the statement when God made everything good, then why did he make Satan? Why did he bring Satan in the world? God didn't. Pride corrupted Lucifer. Pride corrupted that archangel in himself. But Satan today, he corrupts everything he can influence today. Everything God has made has been good. And, and Satan has come along and has worked his work of corruption. He is an influencer of this world. You know, you think about the music that, that, uh, want, that we have, and there's uh, Satan that comes along and wants to corrupt the music. You see the uh, family that God has made of a, a man and a woman as a husband and wife, and, and they rear a family together and have a family, a nucleus there. I think that today they call it the nuclear family. I'm not sure they got to give things name, but that's been corrupted now. And who brought that along? Well, Satan has. And all the philosophies, all the teachings about these new families now and, and the new system of, of society, that was Satan influencing his corruption in the world. Everything that God has made has been good. He made Adam and Eve. They were good in the Garden of Eden. And uh, then Satan came to Eve and, and tempted her to sin, and, and he corrupted her, and she then affected uh, Adam, and they both fell, and the human race fell. And isn't it awful to think about what Satan has done in this world? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 tells us wherein in times past, Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, talking about Satan, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Satan has been and always will continue to be a destructive influence. He doesn't have the power to come to you directly and do something to you, but he influences you. That's the only power he has. You ever have a friend that influences you? 
and uh, you end up doing something wrong, getting caught for it. Say, well, what kind of friend was that? And uh, I'll tell you a story. Don't don't can, don't be don't uh, judge me by it. Amen. I'm going to tell a story on myself. My freshman year of Bible college, we went to uh, Hiles Anderson College, and we we're getting ready for something called church education. And uh, all the male students had to take that class at least one year. And if you're going into the ministry as a pastor, assistant pastor, missionary, you took it every year, same class every year. Well, it was a it was a different college, I'll tell you at that time. I mean, there's we just got had finished done with chapel. Chapel is always an exciting time. When a, a speaker came out, the whole student body stood up and cheered and applauded and, and excited about hearing some preaching. And it was a very, very, very different spirit. And and when I was there, I mean, you're in chapel. It's not church now, understand, not church. And and all of a sudden, guys are flying airplanes. I mean, they're sailing across the yeah, you know, I don't know how many sits in there, a thousand seat auditorium, sailing across there. One fellow brought in these blow up frisbees. You can blow them up in front. I mean, everything's going on in there, you know. And and class hadn't started yet, so all this is happening. And and so uh, one of the teachers was getting the class in order. And uh, and so he's trying to get everybody to settle down. He says, "I see one more airplane. You throw that airplane, you're going to eat it." And okay. And uh, now this is a teacher who had one eye. He's blind to one eye. And uh, brother, uh, I can't remember his last name right now. But uh, anyway, so I'm sitting toward the back over there, where all the backsliders sit. No, I'm sitting over in the backside of the uh, auditorium. And there's a fellow next to me. I barely knew him. And uh, he's got this big airplane. And I said, "Just throw the thing." Well, I said just throw the thing because the teacher had his head down. He can only see out of one eye. All right, he's taking notes. Throw the airplane. I said, throw it, Mike. Get rid of it. I thought he had turned to his left and throw it or to his right and throw it. He threw it right at the platform. And that thing sailed over the top of his head and landed right behind his feet. And he popped up and said, who threw that? And uh, so slowly Mike rose up. He said, I did it. Get up here. He knew him. You're, the guy had to stand there and eat that whole paper airplane in front of the studio, all the guys in the class, you know. What is that? That's the wrong influence, all right? And uh, that's, how, you know, you can be influenced by, I don't know why I told you that story. I'm a sinner. Uh, I've been saved since then, amen. And, uh, but, you know, we look at our life. We struggle in our world. We feel like absolute Sometimes failures in ourself. We're doing well, and all of a sudden we do something not so well. Somebody makes us angry at a, in a store or in a restaurant. Somebody cuts in front of us in a parking lot. Or, and boy, all of a sudden we just get mad. And we, or there we go, you come to church, and all of a sudden the Sunday school teacher teaches, starts teaching on, you need to read your Bible. And you sit there and say, well, I know, I haven't read it in weeks. Or someone may start teaching or preaching on prayer. I haven't talked to God in a long time. Talk about forgiveness. Well, I'm not, I haven't forgiven that person. I'm really mad. You know, we look at ourselves. We say, man, I'm a, a failure. How can I ever make it throughout uh, this Christian walk that I have? Now, we must understand the world we live in, too. Uh, I'm not making any excuses, but there is something going on. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, talking about believers before they are saved. For you are sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In verse 11, it goes on again to say, And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, when man fell, he became corrupt in his mind and in his heart. Man was a corrupt being. Adam and Eve fell. It wasn't just a small, singular little matter that happened. It was a, a great big deal that happened there. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, and God saw the wickedness of man, uh, that, that, that the wickedness of man is great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Today, the born again believer is at war with his old nature and his flesh. When we were saved, it didn't eradicate the old nature, it didn't push out the old sinful man, he's still right there with you. And I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know already because you probably struggle already in things. 
you have wrong thoughts, you say they're impure thoughts, not right thoughts, I'm struggling with that, I, uh, I, I, I listen to things that I know are wrong, this influenced me to wrong, I do that, all this is happening. And uh, the born again believer now is at war, he wants to do right, but he finds himself doing wrong. Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 7. He said, the things I desire to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. There's nothing good in me. He said, the battle is of the flesh and of the spirit, and we are in that battle right now. And we are now to walk, though, as born-again believers in a new way, a way that in God's eyes is good. Why? God created everything, and it was good. And so we're supposed to find ourselves back to that place that's good in the eyes of God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Therefore we are buried by him, uh, uh, with him by baptism into death, that like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We're not talking now about essentially water baptism that's important that the believer should follow. But you and I were baptized into the body of Christ spiritually. And once we were, once we received Christ, now we're supposed to walk a new walk. No one told me I should stop cursing after I got saved. I just knew that wasn't right. Stop cursing. No one said I had to stop doing this or stop doing that. There was something, but I knew a little bit about what I had to change, but my life became different. It changed. Why? Because I was created new again. I was created uh, in that new man now. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, we look at the passage you find here in Jeremiah, in Isaiah. It talks about God being the, the potter. I think most of us understand what a potter is, how they have a, a wheel and a, a circular uh, table. They would spin, they'd pedal it with their foot, and they'd be able, able to create beautiful vases or, or whatever it might be uh, just by working it with their hands. Now, there are times when, and I, in this uh, chap, uh, passage in Jeremiah, it said that the clay was marred in the potter's hands. I haven't worked with clay since probably first grade, all right? Maybe, maybe younger than that. I haven't worked with clay. But I understood some things about clay is if you get some pieces that are hardened inside that clay, you really can't work with it very well. And uh, I don't know what I was making. I think I was making little bowl, crooked bowls for my mother at that time, you know, and taking them home. But you get little chunks in there, and you have to pull it all out and re-smooth it and wet it again and, and work it and, and get it soft. The next day, you get that same piece of clay. It's dry. You wet it. You work it. And you create then out of that. God is talk, uh, talking to us here about our life. He's talking about how we live our life. Sometimes God is working in your world, in your life specifically. And uh, sometimes there has to be a remaking from time to time in our life because he's finding some impurities in there. He's finding some hard pieces of stone or, or a clay in there. He can't work with. He has to move that out and he has to dampen it again and soften it again and work with it again. You know, there's going to be, there's going to be a time when you fall in your walk in Christ. But strive not to. Strive never to fall. Strive never to stumble. But there will be times. The more you strive not to fall, the, farther, the, the lesser you are going to fall. Let me say, say, let me say this. You know, some people live their Christian life and they are striving to live for the Lord in their life. And they don't miss church. They're always in church. They're, they're always doing the Christian thing. But there's times they fall in their heart. They become angry and bitter, resentful, unforgiving. There's sometimes words come out that shouldn't be come out out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaketh. There's some corruption in the heart. There's things that no one will ever see, but they're always in their place. They're always in the pew. They're always uh, in their position in the church, but they're struggling inside. God sees all of those things, and you and I see all those things happening to us. You say, my thoughts aren't right. My mind is not right, and my heart is not right toward God or toward my fellow man. I'm struggling, but you know, the more we strive to live that new life, as I said, 
you won't fall as far. Yeah, I thank God. I'm glad those people are still in church that are struggling, but you don't even know they're struggling. It's the ones that fall far when they get away from church altogether. They get angry at God. They, they can't blame God, so they blame some human being in the process, and that's just the course of the matter. That's the way it goes. They'll find any little flaw, anything they said, any, any way they acted, and they'll find that and say, that's the reason. But it's actually rebellion or, or some resentment or anger towards God. People get away from God, and they blame him. And say, then they say, the whole church is bad. They're all hypocrites. And they create all these ideas in their head. But I want to just encourage you this morning. No matter where you fall or when you fall or how far you fall, we can always come back to God. We can always come back to the potter. In Isaiah 61, verse 3, it tells us, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. You know, we can take our life that was once redeemed, and, and, and all it needs to be is redeemed one time, but taken. And all of a sudden, we live this life and we're influenced. Our old nature is being influenced. Our actions are being influenced. And we just begin to ruin our whole life. We ruin our testimony. We ruin our reputation. We ruin our, our good name we have. And, and we burned everything up, so to speak. And God is telling us that you can take that which you've destroyed, which I've given you, you've destroyed uh, by the, uh, the wrong influence, by your old nature. And you can bring those to me. And God said, I can take those ashes and I can put them on the wheel again. And I begin to refashion your life. And I can remold your life. And I can give you a beautiful life from this point on. But let me remind you about something. It doesn't mean you're going to have the same life. Not going to have the same life. You're not going to have the same testimony in front of people you had before. You're not going to have the same good reputation you had before. But God said, I can make that life a beautiful life, a testimony of my grace and by my power. And that's why he says that he might be glorified. I can take the oil of uh, joy for your mourning, your heartbreak, your sorrow, your grieving. And he said, bring that to me and I'll give you joy. I can give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We have a wonderful God that loves us and a God that will help us. Our fall can come by different ways. It can come by just the way of rebellion. Just rebellious against God, rebellious against His Word, and that leads to a fall. I don't want somebody to tell me what to do. I, don't, I want to live my own life. I don't need a, a pastor. I don't need a Sunday school teacher. I don't need this Bible. I'm just going to live my That's rebellion. Or it can come by the sins of the flesh, the temptations of the flesh, some addictions. Something we get ourselves involved in and drawn away into the flesh of, of immorality or, or whatever it might be, we're drawn away. We can fall by the area of pride. I am never going to forgive that person for what they did. But I love them. You know, this area of pride, I don't need to go to church I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to pray. I'm fine. God is pleased. That area of pride. It can come by bitterness. It can come by resentment, anger towards God. All these things can cause us to fly, uh, to, to uh, fall. But in, in any case, darkness begins to overtake the believer again. And we find ourselves far away from God. Why? Because you and I need to be very careful. That old nature is still there. That old man is still there. And he is more powerful at the time when you're a younger believer than when you're older. But it doesn't matter. That nature is still there. You say it's more powerful now or later. Well, because later you've grown in the Lord. Later you've gotten victory over many of your sins in your life. And now you developed a good godly character. And now you're faithful to God, but he still lurks. And he can cause you to trip and fall. When you're younger, you're just getting involved. You're just trying to get with the Lord, your relationship with the Lord, stable and, and where it should be. And, and you're beginning to grow and to work. And, but the temptation might be a little greater than 
But either way you look at it, the flesh is always there. You, you got to be careful. And that's why we ought to not be around people that still practice the sins that we have lived in in the past. That's why a, a person who struggles with alcohol should not be around anybody who drinks alcohol. You say, well, I want to be their friend. Be their friend when they're not drinking alcohol. Don't be around them when they are. Don't go to a bar somewhere, a nightclub somewhere, and say, well, I'm just drinking a Coke here, uh, a Diet Pepsi, whatever it might be. Don't get around that. If you want to quit smoking, don't hang around smokers. The temptation is there. The whole idea, this is just sensibility. This is wisdom that God gives us. And so some, if we're in a grown Lord, there's going to be some we have to separate from. Not because we don't like them or don't love them, but, but their temptation, their lifestyle is a temptation to us. And if I stay close to them, I'm going to be right back where I was before. The fact, the matter is, though no matter what happens, we have a Heavenly Father that will take us back. He'll take us back. We're told in James, draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. You know, when I consider that, I try and understand how big God is. The scriptures tell us that the heavens cannot even contain the glory of God. All the universe can't even contain the glory of God. So in my little thinking here, that means that's a mighty big God we serve. And if he takes a step, he takes bigger steps than I do. When I'm in my sin, you're the sinful people over here, all right? When I'm in my sin, and I say, I'm going to turn back to God, and I make that step, I'm going to tell you right now, that's all it needs. That's all I need. Because when I make that step, you know who's right there? God is right there. He is right there to receive me back. He's right there to take me back. He loves me. He wants to be able to forgive me. He's forgiven me of my sins. It'll keep me out of heaven. But there's a relationship that we have on earth that our sins will separate us from our God. And we can't have fellowship with Him and know Him and walk with Him. And those are the sins we deal with as believers now. But I can come and God loves me and God wants fellowship with me. And so He's willing to receive me back. We are told in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and, he, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Coming to Christ, let me tell you something. Coming to Christ, I'm over here in sin. I'm out here smoking and drinking Brother Tim. And I'm out in sin out there somewhere. He's not laughing about this. And, uh, but, and I turn back. And I say, God, I've sinned against you. I've, I've been with Tim. I've been drinking and smoking. Ruin my testimony. And I confess my sins to him, and he forgives me right then. And you know what he gives me right then? A fresh start. When he forgives me, he forgets all those things I've done. And he gives me a fresh start with him right now. He said, follow me. And I follow him. And God's not saying, now don't go back and do that again. Oh, I remember. I, I got a watch on you now. You're on a short lease, buddy. And God doesn't do this. He says, just follow me. And I can follow him. I have a fresh start. And every believer has a fresh start. Coming to Christ creates that for us. Whether it's the first time we have that fresh start through salvation. I'm so thankful for the day I got saved. So thankful. When I realized how wicked and vile I was, now I was on my way to hell. And I realized that Jesus loved me so much and died for me and gave me a gift. I received eternal life. It all started new for me, a fresh life. And I was able to move on. And that same thing can happen to believers in their walk since they've been saved right now. You stumble, you fall in your Christian walk, in a Christian life. No matter how long you've been away, Christ will always be there. He'll always be there to forgive if we turn to Him and come to Him. But a second thing, let me mention here. We can be remade again. What do you mean by that? The potter was making a vessel. But the vessel is marred. Now, when you create again, that vessel is going to be beautiful, but it's not the exact same one that was started. It's renewed. And when the Lord saves us, He's creating a life in us, and we stumble and fall from time to time. And sometimes there are minor things where the vessel doesn't have to be changed that much, but sometimes there's some big things. Suppose a, a pastor gets off into his sin, he forfeits his place to ever be 
biblically in a pulpit again. He violates some things that, that God, some standards God has and restrictions God has on that man. Can, can God ever use him again? Yes, he can, absolutely. But he may never be able to stand in a pulpit and pastor again. He has lost that privilege, that opportunity that God had given him. He forfeited it. And now he's going to create in that man a new life. And he may become one of the grandest and greatest Sunday school teachers that church has ever had. He may become an aide to that new pastor there, an assistant to him, and lift him up and help him and, and encourage him and motivate him to continue on and do great things. God has a way of taking our life as we sometimes can follow it up pretty good and remake us all again. I think of King David. When David sinned in his adultery with Bathsheba, but then he had Bathsheba's husband murdered in a time of warfare, tried to cover up during a battle. He is restored back to God again. You read in the 51st Psalm, David's cry of seeking forgiveness, and God forgave him. But David had a desire in his heart to build a temple for God. He lost that privilege. He says, you won't build that temple, but your son will, Solomon. He'll build that temple. David, you won't because you're a bloody man. You're a man of war. You forfeited these things right here. He forfeited his family being close, knit it. It broke apart. And uh, it went on and went on. But if you read from that point on, that, after that point, is when David wrote all the Psalms that we have. He didn't write in all of them. But he wrote a majority of it. That's where the Psalms came from, his heart. A broken heart, a contrite heart. He came back to God and he saw God in a way he never knew him to be before. And God remade his life into something spectacular. And it wasn't as he was at the first. But it was grand and beautiful. And, and uh, uh, that he made later on. I think of Jonah. Jonah rebelled against God. He just did not want to go to Nineveh and preach there. The Ninevites were conquering the world at that time, and they would soon be in Israel and conquer Israel. And he knew what would happen, and he heard the, the, the events of how they conquered and what they did. He wanted no part of them. He'd rather them die and go to hell. But he ran from God. He fled from him, and God got his attention by swallowing him up in a great fish. It didn't take but a few days for him to get his senses back to get order and get right with God. And, and that old fish had a stomach ache, amen? And he went to the shore and he just relieved himself of the problem he had and gave it back to God. Uh, Jonah, amen, came out of there. Now let me, let me tell you about it. Jonah was never the same man. Jonah was personally, physically scarred from the events that took place. The acids within that, that fish or that whale would have, have taken all the color off his skin. He would have been like a ghost, all the hair would have been burned off his body, the facial hair, eyebrows, all that taken off. And he would look quite different from that point on. But, De but Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached probably the one of the greatest revivals the world has ever seen. There have been over a million souls living in that city at the time. And the Bible says they all turned to God and sat cloth and ash and repented. And, and the city was saved from God's judgment. But he was a different man. But was he worse off? In some ways, yes. But in other ways, God used him in a great way. This is our God. I think of Peter. Peter was a, boy, Peter had a lot of zeal, didn't he? I mean, Peter wasn't afraid to speak up. Sometimes he shouldn't have, but he spoke up a lot. Hey, he, he thought things. He was, a, he was an outgoing personality. And Christ foretold they would all deny him. And he said, not I. Not I. And all the disciples, after they heard Peter, said, not us either. He looked at Peter and realized Peter's heart and his love for him. He said, Peter, before the cock crow twice, you'll deny me three times. And he did. The Bible says that the third time Jesus looked upon him. They may have been able to see one another, I don't know. But it said he went out and wept bitterly. In fact, he gave up. He said, I'm a failure. I've done the most awful thing a man could do. I've turned my back on the Lord and Savior. I, I rejected knowing him. I rejected all that. But Jesus Christ came to him again. 
And Paul, uh, Peter was restored again. And, and behold what happened with Peter now. Peter was still a very forward individual, but he learned what to say now. He stood on the day of Pentecost and preached, and 3,000 souls were saved. Peter became the, the leader of the New Testament church era at that time, and Peter stood for Christ all the way to his own crucifixion. No vessel will ever be exactly the same, but God can take a life and make it wonderful and make it beautiful. Grace is bestowed upon all who come, receiving what we don't deserve. We don't deserve. We receive forgiveness, and we receive another chance. It's often been preached, and I would preach another sermon on Jonah someday, God of the second chance. But I want to also mention, he's a God of the third chance, and the fourth chance, and the in infinity chance. Let me say that. As often as we come back to him, his grace is there. He's willing to receive us. Why? He loves us. And he knows the battle that we face. He walked in this world in the flesh. He knows the temptations of flesh. Forty days in the wilderness being tempted. Forty days. He understands what man has to go through. He was uh, uh, fully filled with the Holy Spirit, overpowering all temptation. But man is not always filled with the Spirit. Man even struggles in that area of his life. So his ability to uh, resist temptation may not be as, as strong as our Lord's was, but... He knows our weakness, and, and He's willing to forgive us. Amen. Your second chance gives everyone faith, everyone the faith that they too can have a fresh start. 2024 starts out in a bang, doesn't it? Bad weather rolls in for a couple weeks, amen. Pastor falls, breaks his pool neck up there. Everything is battling against us. And we struggle spiritually in our life. We say, you know, it's, it's been difficult. I have people in my family, in my life. I'm, I just feel like I'm, I'm just carrying such a burden for them. And sometimes we get away and we lose our, our ability to walk with the Lord as we want to. We make promises to Him. And we don't fulfill those promises. We make resolutions to him, and we don't fulfill those resolutions. And after a while, we say, why do I keep trying? Why do I keep going to an altar? Why do, why do I keep coming to God and making promises to him? And That's the desire of my heart, but look at me. I, I just fail time and time again. I, I don't know. I'm just going to give up on myself. I'll just go to church and, and quit promising God anything. I'm going to tell you something right now. I like that desire you have in your heart, and God does too. I like the promises you make, and God does too. And never give up on those. It's a struggle to get where you want to be in life. But God is always willing to forgive your failures and lift you up again into fellowship with Him and empower you to do those things that you have in your heart to do. You know, we, we can't give up because Christ has never given up on us yet. He has never given up on us yet, and He won't. And you can have a fresh start, a fresh start that no one in this church may even be aware of. Starting a new day. And Christ can give that to you. A new beginning is important for everyone. It's important for everyone. I always get excited this time of year. I look so forward to pastoring the church and, and, and trying to come up with some things that God might give me in my heart that our church can do and going forward and, and watching God bless and watching more souls get saved and people come into the church, I get so excited about that. See, how'd it go last year? Well, I wish it would have went better. I'm looking forward to a better year, though. How about the year before? I always wish the previous year was a little bit better, amen? I'm always looking for more that God can give us in our life. So this is wonderful. It's a, a great time of year. You could uh, make a, a decision about your church attendance and, and thank God that you're here, amen. I'm glad you're here, but you say, maybe I'm not attending as faithful as I could. Maybe I'm not reading my Bible as faithfully as I should. Maybe my prayer life is non-existent. I just pray a little here and a little there. Uh, maybe my good character is not as good as I want it to be and hope it to be. And 
It goes on and on. We look at our life and say, what can I be for Christ in 2024? I'm going to tell you right now, he is a God that will give you another chance if you feel like you've done wrong, another chance to feel like you've fallen short. He's a God, a Savior, our brother, that says, I will be there for you. As long as you live and breathe on this earth, Dale, no matter how time, time, many times you fall before me and confess, my hand will be there lifting you up and saying, you're going to make it this time. You're going to make it this time. And I'll move on forward. And he'll be there for all of us in every sense of the way. Let's bow our heads, please, this morning with this thought. Let's search our heart and our soul as we put ourselves into the potter's hands, as he takes control, as we give him that control. You say, Pastor, I've I feel like I'm just a failure. Maybe you have, but it doesn't have to stay that way. Today, just bring your ashes to him. You say, I really messed some things up. That's all right. Just bring those ashes to him. What what can my life, what could it be? It'll be something wonderful and beautiful that you've never imagined or thought God would do something in your life. It's a a time right now to restart your spiritual life. You say it's not been where it it ought to be. I know that. I I keep saying I'm going to do something. I keep promising myself I'm going to do something. Now, in your own power, your own strength, you're going to fall and fail. But this is an opportunity right now to say, January 14th in 2024, Lord, I'm coming to you. And I want to restart something in my life. I want to trust you that you will give me victory in my life. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for those that were able to make it to the services. And and Lord, we're so thankful that you're the God of a second chance. And Lord, you look to us to turn to you and, and you'll respond quickly. You'll be there. And I don't know where people are at in their hearts, in their personal walk with you in the decisions they made and maybe have not kept. And Father, maybe the sins they're struggling with right now. But Lord, I pray that you help all of us, Lord, to come to you and realize that you're not a God that's going to just throw us away and cast us out, but you're a God that will rework us and work in our life and, and make us a beautiful vessel. Now, please bless this morning, Lord. Speak to us, I pray. Help us to respond to what you're speaking to us in our heart about in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together as our organist plays. And maybe this morning God has spoke to you about some things. This is something between you and him. It's coming to him. Oh, I could be one that would... I could be so despondent about my own actions, my own thoughts, my own life. I can get so discouraged about who I am. And I realize that God can take my life and make something better out of it. Just come to him. Just turn to him. He's already there. Already there, waiting.
All right, you can go ahead and be seated at this time. We're so thankful, and we praise the Lord for decisions made, especially our young people making decisions in their life spiritually. And uh, Abby Moninger has been saved, trusting Christ as her personal Savior. How long ago would you, would you say she was saved, Brian? Last year sometime about six months ago or so. And uh, she wants to follow the Lord and believers baptism this morning, so we're very excited about that. And uh, so just stay with us as we get ready for this baptism. What a, a wonderful experience it is for her, and uh, what a joy it is for me to watch these decisions being made. And so uh, we'll be just a few minutes in. sure if you can see Abby or not, but this is Abby Mondinger, and Abby, on your public profession of your faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. The servant said, Master, we have done as thou hast commanded, yet there is room 
Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed for this morning. Father, thank you for the decision made here this morning. And Lord, for your young life coming to you and following in obedience and baptism. We pray that you bless that life, Father. And Lord, I pray that you bless us. And help us, Father, to be faithful to you. And we look forward to being back in the services tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.